my subject is the female minister. The Bible tells us how Jesus came on earth and ordained 12 apostles that they may lead and introduce the body of Christ, the New Testament church. And when Jesus came, he took 12 men and trained them and turned them from ordinary people, ordinary kissing fishermen, made apostles out of them. Ordinary, impatient fishermen, they had bad temper. John wanted to bring the entire city down with his temper. But these are the people that God transformed to his image. And after he has done with the man, he permitted that women will also preach the gospel. Because God made man first. There should be no confusion. There should, no, there should be no argument about this. Because we are coming to an era where there's so much confusion in, on the internet and on places. And people preach that a woman can't do this, a woman can't do that. But God is right to choose 12 men. The man is first. The man is the head. There is no way God would have chosen women to mix up men, to train them and ordain all of them. Because God created man first. And so when Jesus had come in the New Testament to create the body of Christ, he still had to follow the pattern of his father. His father made the man and showed the man how to till the ground. He taught the man how to name everything. And when he had finished, he now created a woman out of the man. So God will have to allow Christ to do it the right way by calling 12 men, training the men, and then making the men name the doctrines of the gospel. And after that, here comes women as ministers. There will be no confusion. Slap somebody's shoulder say, I'm not confused here. And in the body of Christ, there have been titles. In the fivefold ministry, which we learn in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10, all the way to 32, write it down, and you want to study that before we come again, that God gave to the body of Christ five important people with the skills of five gifts. To build the church and make the church be right. The church is the bride of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4. From verse 10 all the way to 32. Among these five, he named one apostle, two prophet, three evangelist, four pastor, and five teacher. Now look at me. To remember this important body, you would use your palm, your your arm, uh, your hands to remember the apostle is the highest title with the order somebody say god is a god of order so the apostle is the thumb then after the apostle the 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 next gifting in the body of christ is the prophet the pointing finger nobody points finger this way to show his house the pointing finger the the, the prophet. After the prophet then we have the evangelist, the longest of all the fingers that must go out and fetch out souls to the house of God. Somebody say order again. Okay. Then the fourth of the authority that governs the church is the pastor. Amen. And that is the decoration of the finger. So you see the pastors are more known. They are beautified people. They are glorified people because that's where the ring is worn. You know, that is the finger that is connected to the heart. So the pastor's heart is after the people. They go after the people. They love the people. It's not everybody that can be a pastor. Some people just can't tolerate any kind of nonsense. If a person is not a born pastor and he's taking care of you, he talked once and he's left you. Whether you fall or you rise, it's up to you. But the pastor seems to follow up. Follow up. Then the last of the gift is the teacher, which is which is the small finger going into your ears and speaking. The pastor is fan of exalting, preaching, 
making the people happy, encouraging them. That's the work of the pastor. But the work of the teacher is to teach you, so it's not too exciting. But as we are learning, in some few weeks now, we've been doing a teaching ministry so that you can understand some things. It is not good to come to church and get excited and sing and dance without having knowledge. The Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. When you know something about something, then something will take place for something. When you are ignorant, I hear somebody clapping. Thank you. When you are ignorant, the devil will mess you up. The name demon simply means to know, to, to the spirit of knowledge. So if you do not know some things in the spirit, you will do a lot of mistakes. Peter was speaking to Jesus. He was advising Jesus on the fact that he's his friend. He does not want him to die. But Jesus had the spirit of cognizance. He could understand that at that very moment, the one that was speaking was not Peter, but it was the devil that had entered him to speak him out of the real purpose why he was born. Therefore, Jesus spoke to the devil and he says, hey, get behind me. I pray, put your hand on your head and say, Lord, give me knowledge. Lord, give me knowledge. Open, my eyes Open my eyes to see beyond the ordinary that I can understand how to wage war in the ranks of the spirits. Ignorance can let you fight and blow in the air. You can be fighting without result because you are not well informed. When the body of Christ has been built upon this fivefold ministry, it now runs through that we now have church workers, we have ministers, we have pastors, then we have reverends, then we have reverend doctors, and we have general overseers, and we have, and the title goes on, on, then we have uh, bishops, then we have archbishops. We also have um, uh, superintendents, general superintendents, and so on and so forth. Today, we are going to learn about El Shaddai, the God that is almighty. What makes him almighty? He is almighty because he performs in the office of two personalities. God performs as a mother and he performs as a father. Therefore, it will be very necessary that in the body of Christ we will have fathers and we will have mothers. Don't be confused here. So if there is any argument in the city against female pastors, female reverends, female bishops, you may know that God intend that there will be two kinds of grooming for his body of Christ. If you agree, say amen. Amen. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6 verse 2, verse 1 and 2 as our first major scripture. Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6, 1 and 2. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Amen. Amen. So this tells you that God has never left the woman in leadership. God has been carrying both authorities along. The confusion that comes in here is that in the house, the office of or the institution of marriage, God did not set confusion in the order. The man is the head and the woman is to assist the man. Somebody say no confusion here. No confusion. There is institutions that God established. He did three institutions in the Bible. The first one is the institution of marriage. Then the second one is to be born again. The institution of getting baptized with the Holy Spirit and also in water. Then you start growing in God. It's a school. It's an institution. It's a faculty that you have to grow up your intellect and know it all in vain. So God has his perfect will. And his perfect will is that the counsel of the mother and 
and of the Father together will work. That's why when a, we have a single mother raising a child, it gets quite risky and dangerous. She will have to perform as a man as well as as a woman. And so if a man is raising a child alone, it's quite very challenging because we have not been given the two offices in our being. God have the two in his being. He's called the Almighty, the El Shaddai, the Breasted One. He has the two. But for human beings, we have males and females. So this is the will of God, that you will first of all obey your parents in the Lord. And then you will honor your father and your mother. Somebody say, we have it all in the church. Take a look at Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8 and 9. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8 and 9. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8 and 9. What do you see there? Yes. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8 and 9. My son, Hear the instructions of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace of unto thy head and chain about thy neck. Amen? Amen. So the Bible from the very beginning is God's intent that we will have instructions from our fathers and the law from our mothers. Let me explain this. It's quite very interesting. When a father is talking to his son, he's communicating to his children, he's fond of saying, children, this is how I want you to make it. I, I want you to go this way. He instructs them. Put the bottle here, put that one here, put this bit there. But when a woman comes in the sin, it's just so rambushous. The woman goes, I just don't want you to do this. You hear me? The woman brings it like a law. But all is beautiful things. It blends so well. And you have to get used to a mother leading you and a father leading you. Children, are you in the house? Yes. Instruction and laws are the same thing. But the law is like a must that you must obey. Instruction is like a gentle way of training somebody to become what he was born to be. And the Bible says these two authorities are vital in our lives. I will therefore encourage us to learn about how possible or why women are also called to lead. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Oh, what they are opening, say, God is deeper than we think. God is deeper than we think. Yes, say it again. God is deeper than we think. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 to 18. And it shall come to pass. In the last days, said God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servant and on my <coughs> and me, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Amen. Amen. This is a scripture quoted from Joel, the book of Joel. And in the book of Acts, the apostle repeated it, communicating it to the, the masses that had come that day to see the glory of God upon the Holy Spirit baptism. He says he will pour his spirit upon all flesh. The maidens will prophesy as well as the men. So the anointing of God comes upon both men and women. Hello? In Luke chapter 8, verse 1 and 3, I'm giving you scriptures to confirm the word of God. Then you will not be confused. Somebody say, I will not be confused. You are learning so that you can defend the cause of the gospel. I see the anointing of God pouring on some women here right now. Amen. 
fire. I actually see the fire of God coming upon some women right now. Yeah. I see somebody receiving the edge to work for God. Yeah. And let the church say, yeah. Amen. Yeah. In Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. And it came to pass afterward that it went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain woman, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa Eros steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. Amen. Amen. So this is a confirmed scripture for us to know that why Jesus had now finished choosing the 12 men, to train them as they being the first of the house of God. He now healed even Magdalene and many more women whose names are listed here to be part of the team of the army of God. We have female pilots. We have female engineers. We have female medical doctors. We have female lawyers. We have female managers, we have female directors, we have female nurses, and so it is good for us to have female pastors, if you agree, clap for God. They both have a duty to play, and they both are very important. Tell somebody I cannot be confused about this. Tell another person, no one will deceive me about this. In Acts chapter 1, Acts, sorry, Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, there is something that Jesus told the apostles and the disciples following him to do. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Acts 2, 1 to to fall. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, <coughs> and it sat upon each of them. Excuse me. <coughs> Amen. So in the book of Acts, Jesus had promised his disciples that he is going, but he will come down again upon them, this time not as a person, one single human being as Christ, but as a person in the spirit. What is the spirit like? How does it look like? Jesus himself told his disciples that the spirit is like the wind. You do not know where it comes from. Neither can you tell where he is going to. And he said, you, when the anointing come upon you, you become like a wind. No one can predict what next. Because God will not give your life in the hands of the enemy to monitor. They will be taken by surprise because of the anointing in your life. Amen. Shout yes, somebody. Yes. And the Holy Spirit poured upon both men and women in the upper room in the upper room where the spirit came upon the spirit did not separate to pour only on the men leaving the women therefore i will encourage everybody's knowledge to understand that the spirit of god is for all men and women say amen to that in galatians chapter 3 verse 26 Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 to 29. He says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized unto Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one Amen. in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 29. And if ye be 
Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed uh -huh. and heirs according to the right. promise. Amen. 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 There is a promise for anyone who becomes an Abraham's seed. What is Abraham's seed? A person born of the spirit by faith. Abraham's seed is a seed of Isaac that was born out of faith, not by works. Mm -hmm. Isaac came when both Sarah and Abraham had lost all the physical power to make children. Therefore, this baby was born by the Spirit. And the baby came through by the Spirit of faith. Therefore, if you are born again and you have faith in God, and the Bible says the just shall live by faith, then you have a heritage, a promise, an inheritance in God. Somebody say, I'm taking all my inheritance right now. I'm all my right now. Whether I'm a male or female. Yeah. So we don't have anything like a long queue in heaven where all the women are standing and waiting so the men will finish their prayer before the women will do. God sits on the truth and responds to all. Because before God, we are all one. There is neither male nor female. He also said there is no Greek nor Jew. In other words, whatever you are, you are, wherever you were born from, once you accept Jesus as your personal savior, then don't separate yourself. Let not the evil look down on the Benin. Let not the Nigerian look down on the Ghanaian. Let not the American look down on the European. We are all born of one spirit. Oh, I heard somebody clapping for that. Hallelujah. And one of the places that I like to talk about is Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 to 10. I like to use and I love this scripture because if you have a deeper understanding to this scripture, you will just know that God has put his spirit on both men and women and he sees all of them the same. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 to 10. Revelation 19, 7 to 10. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Write. Somebody say, take record. Take record. <laughs> Somebody say, I'm reading it now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. It was written as he told him to write. It was written. That's why we have the opportunity to read it in verse 9. And he said unto him, write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at my feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See that thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren. Have and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Amen. This scripture means that everybody, everybody wears a flowing garment. A flowing garment. That's why you can see the priests, whether male or female, they wear a flowing garment. And the the angel was communicating to John, the Apostle John, as he sees a vision, seeing all the saints in one attire. They were all in a flowing white linen garment. And he says, this is the righteousness of the saints. And they are all called the bride 
of Christ, prepared for the marriage supper, which is the eschatology lessons we are learning that we will be raptured to heaven for a marriage supper for seven years and we will come back to rule with Christ on earth. Somebody say it is written. It is written. And so now the angel spoke to John and John was amazed to see and to hear such a thing and he bowed to worship that angel and the angel said no, no, don't do it. I'm just one of you. You should worship God. Only God. Nobody should worship any angel. Nobody should exalt any angel above the word of God. For the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, when Jesus comes into your life, he informs you of all that God has spoken about. And we have already learned that prophecy is what? The intent of God revealed by his spirit so prophecy is the foreknowledge of god for you so the spirit of christ is always ready to reveal to you the mind of god about every decision you are taking god have never left you out just spend a little time with god and he will continue to talk to you and show you tomorrow the psalmist says because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives. All my fears is gone because he lives. He has. He is. He is what the spirit of prophecy. He makes you know ahead. And everything in this prophecy is the Bible. Is sealed. There is no brand new prophecy. All right. Is right in the Bible. Nothing new. Don't go about rooming and looking for prophecy. Pick up the Bible. What God is saying about you is right in here. He Amen. said that you will be blessed. Amen. That you may have life. <laughs> Somebody says high life is high life. Is high life. And have it not in pieces, not management, not, not in survival form, but have it in more abundantly. Hallelujah. 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 That is the spirit of prophecy. Tell somebody it's the will of God that I will have more than enough. Oh, turn and tell somebody, are you getting jealous about me having more than enough? <laughs> Somebody get ready for two garages. I must pack two, three, four cars. It's God's will that we shall be well. You see. Hallelujah. Stand up and say, I curse every prophet, poverty in my life. Say, I refuse to be poor. I refuse to be poor. So I bind the demon of poverty. For it is written that only goodness and mercy of God shall follow me all the days of my life. Oh, that somebody say I have come to enjoy. Yes, 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 yes. Enjoy life. Enjoy life. Enjoy life. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Philippians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Philippians chapter 4. Verse 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. 2 and 3. I beseech Odias <coughs> and beseech Sinti that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true your fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice. Mm -hmm. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I beseech Eodias. I beseech Saiteach that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Why? Because some people were in the church, but they had different mind. And he said, now listen, I entreat you to help the women who are preaching the gospel with me, Paul. This is the write-up of Paul. Whose 
those names are written in the book of life. Oh, if you are a woman, clap for Jesus. Glory. <laughs> because a woman is an emotional being. When a woman is a leader, it takes a lot of energy. Unlike a man. A man, a man is able to take one thing at a time. Their focus is one thing at a time. And when a man has finished a meeting and he gets home, once his eyes are set on soccer or football, that's where his eyes are. But a woman can be watching soccer and thinking about rice on the, in the kitchen at the same time, thinking about this and that. So it is very difficult for a woman to lead because the woman can carry so many things at the same time. And so here comes Paul asking the men to assist the woman because they are also part of the team who will be receiving rewards in the book of life. In the Bible, there is a powerful woman of God called Priscilla. Let's look at her in the book of Acts 18. Priscilla. Somebody's baby is called Priscilla, right? Acts 18, verse 26. Acts 18, verse 26. Acts 18, verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Acts 18. Acts 18.26 Okay, go on. And he began I want to be sure of that. Yes. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expanded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into... Verse 26 only. only. At 18, 26. Amen? Amen? At 18, 26. Now, we hear the name of a Bible teacher, powerful Bible teacher over there, whose name is what? Priscilla. Amen. Priscilla. Mm -hmm. So, these are the people that the Bible have quoted them to be Bible teachers. And the Bible says that they had to pull out an, a, a, a disciple to teach that disciple very well. Women are very good teachers. They teach so well. We have great men of God who were raised by women. And they, are, they also have a good tender heart to raise children very well, even though they are weaker vessels. When the Bible says they are weaker vessels, it, it means a lot, and it is very true. We would not um, refuse what is said about the woman, neither will we ignore it. The word weaker simply means that they wait on authority. They wait on authority. Number two, they are emotional. And when a person is emotional, he can easily shed tears. He can also be too happy to be harmed. When a soldier is at war, he doesn't get too happy. A woman is a weaker vessel because a woman can be too excited to her own danger. They are easily deceived. Because they operate with the heart, not with the mind. So this makes them weaker. However, they are great, great teachers. Amen? Amen? So Priscilla is one of the women mentioned in the Bible that taught. Then we also have in Romans 16 verse 3 Romans 16 verse 3 Romans 16 verse 3 mm -hmm. Great Priscilla and Aquila my helpers in Christ Jesus. And so it is emphasized over here that again Priscilla was a great helper for the work of Paul. When you, when a man finds a female minister that assists him to do the work and to join in as a co-partner, it goes very well. So, Priscilla is mentioned over here again by Paul. So Paul had great respect for women. I really don't know the kind of Bible people have that says that Paul says women should not teach. 
it is, I think, a misquoted scripture that has not given out the Hebrew meaning or the Greek meaning very well. So we have over here these great teachers. Can you imagine? Look at Acts 18, verse 2. Acts 18, verse 2. Also, Acts 18, verse 2. Acts 18, verse 2. Acts 18, verse 2. And found a certain Jew named Aquila. Now, let's start from verse 1. Verse 1. Yes. But Acts 18, 18, verse 1 and 2. After these things, Paul departed from Athens mm -hmm. and came to Corinth mm -hmm. and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. So, Paul found comfort with two people, husband and wife, who are preachers of the gospel, and it's the same Priscilla, whose husband is called Aquila. And he was with them and found comfort. And I can see that The country of our name is right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Clap for that. Yeah. Oh, what's your clapping? Say, chap, we will eat with Amen. 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 Where are they coming from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody say, make it plain. Make it plain. So it's appropriate that Daddy and I can actually preach. So if he is sitting and I'm standing here, tell somebody, don't get confused. <laughs> it's in order. It's in order. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Acts 16 verse 13 and 14. Acts 16 verse 13 and 14. Acts 16 verse 13 and 14 say the spirit of knowledge come upon me no one can confuse my life because I am reading the scripture my life will never be the same at 16 verse 13 to 14 and on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made and we sat down and spake unto the women, which resorted tighter. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Tytira, which worshipped God, had us, whose hearts the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Amen. Amen. Now, Paul and Timothy had taken a, a, a mission trip. And when they went, Paul had so much heart to preach to the women. He, he saw the kindness of the women. While the men were hardly persecuting him, he found comfort in ministering to the women. And automatically, you know that women always are very quick to the things of God than men. And we want to respect men for that. It is not right for a man to be carried away just like that. A man takes his time to study you and be sure of who you are. They are not follow, follow, so it's still okay. So here comes Paul preaching. And there a lady called Lydia, a businesswoman. And her business was a high class business because she was dealing with the high society fabrics, textiles. He sells materials and he was into purple trading. And the pe purple fabrics were sold for the kings. And therefore, she was very rich. As, as at that time, he should be ascribed as a billionaire. And Paul ministered to her. And she got born again with some women at the place. And he even ended up asking them to come home and turn her house into a chapel. And the woman became a great teacher and a leader of the way of God. Amen. Amen. I didn't hear the women clapping for that. So tell one woman, are you a businesswoman? You can still preach the gospel. 
verse, let's look at verse 40 of that same at 16. Verse 40 of that same at 16. Verse 40. Yes, he says, and they went out of, of the prison. prison and entered into the house of who? Yeah. Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. So, again, when Paul and um, is it Paul and Silas had gone into a prison and God had released them, they found themselves walking to Lydia's house where the church was. They met all the brethren there and there they fellowshiped and after that they moved to another country. So Lydia had a brethren at home, a chapel in the house where Paul ministered after she got born again. Don't end your born again only to one side. Extend it more. Give all that you have unto God. Open your house that the house of God will come into your house. Your houses can be a place of fellowship, of praying, because Lydia did it and you can do it too. We also now have a lady who was a head pastor in the Bible called Phoebe. We shall find her in the book of Acts. Oh, let's look at Romans 16, 1 and 2. Romans 16, 1 and 2. Romans chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. Quick. Romans 16, 1 and 2. I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which at Centuria, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that you assist her in whatsoever business she had need of you. For she had been a superior of many, and of myself also. Phoebe was the head pastor of the church called Church of Sanctuary in Corinth. And she had to travel to the other churches around Corinth to minister the word of God under the protection and the covering of Paul. And so Paul had to write to the church that they should listen to Phoebe. She's coming with the word of God, the pastor in charge of this church in one province of Corinth. Corinth was a big place and they had big, big churches there to the glory of God. And among these churches was one church that a woman was leading and her name is Phoebe. So we have women leaders in the church. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, we read this from Romans 16, 1 and 2. So let's now look at another powerful woman of God who was actually a bishop in Romans 16, verse 15. Romans 16, verse 15. Romans 16. 15. Salute Philogos. 1, 6, verse 1, 5. Mm -hmm. Salute Philogos and Julia, Nerios and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Amen. Amen. Now, this Julia in the Apostles was a very powerful leader and of course an elected supreme authority. This Julia received also a letter from even Apostle John in 1 John chapter 1 verse 1 and then verse 10 and he called her the elect lady. Now, the, the word elect, if you want to look at it, look at it. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. 1 John, not Apostle John, but the book, the epistles of John. 1 John 1, 1. Mm -hmm. That which was from the... Oh, sorry, 2 John 1, 1. Sorry, 2 John 1, one second book of epistles of John, verse one. Mm -hmm. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, 
but also all they that have known the truth. Amen. Amen. He said, I'm writing this letter to the elder and to the elect lady. The elder. The elect lady. Now, if you read this version in the in the Greek Bible, because the New Testament was originally written in the Greek and now translated into English. In the Greek Bible, he used the word kuria. I'm writing this letter to the woman kuria, and the word kuria means supreme authority, the bishop of the church. And John had to write to her, and John says something that have been my duty. He says, I'm writing to her and to the children that love the truth. It is going to be a shame and an embarrassment for a woman to lead when his children are not. So this is a good example. And I'm sure we are working hard on that. Amen. We appreciate God for Amen. that grace. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So the woman can be a supreme leader in the house of God in the New Testament. And there is always something that is, uh, is given to the woman who is a supreme leader. There is a caution, a carefulness, a warning that is given to the supreme leader if he's a woman because the woman is a weaker vessel. Somebody say, make it plain. I just don't like the way sometimes we pastors don't want to say it all. And we, we preach the gospel according to how it suits us. This Bible was not written by women. So the Bible talks to women to humble themselves to their own husbands. Neither is this Bible written by men. If men wrote this Bible, they would remove the part that says men love your wives. Oh yes, they will take it off. They will say it. If this Bible was written by children, you are sure what they will remove from it. Children, obey your parents from of, in the law. They will take that part from it. If this Bible was written by parents, they will take the part that says do not provoke your children. Oh, oh yes. they clap for Jesus, clap for the Holy Spirit. If this Bible was written by pastors, then it will be removed. The portion that says, pastors don't chop church money. <laughs> hmm? But then the Bible says that pastors should be accountable. They should not drink and booze. They should have common sense to lead the people. They should rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible was not written by congregations. If not, they will remove the part that says, pay your tithe. Tell me about it. <laughs> so this Bible is a package, a book written by God. How was it written? An inspiration that came, came upon the people to write it. It's, it's amazing that the, the King David wrote portions of Bible, of quotations that Christ will come and use when he is on earth. He, Jesus read Psalm 118 after the communion service and he was on his way to die for mankind. And Jesus quoted the, the hymns of David. He said, this is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So this Bible is written down that we may all be admonished by it. It is not a Bible that anyone can manipulate. It is the Bible from God and everybody has his portion in it. That's why it is called the Word of God, the Sword of God. And it is called the Double-Edged Sword. So when I pull the sword and turn it to you, I have my portion that the Bible turns to me. It is for all of us. Clap for the Bible. Clap for the Bible. Hallelujah. So you will not be confused. In the New Testament, I have given you accounts of people that God have used, including women. Let's look at verse 10 
of this first John, second John chapter one. Yes, the verse ten of second John chapter one. What do you see there? If they Can come. Any unto you, yes, and bring not this doctrine, mm -hmm. receive him not mm -hmm. into your house, ha. neither bid him God speak. Man. So, Paul is talking to the woman, the woman is the bishop, and the woman is emotional, the woman is soft and kind, the woman would want to open his door once he sees anybody holding Bible. Oh, come on, welcome, sit down. And so, Paul warns the woman. Uh, sorry, John warns the woman and he says, even though you are a bishop, I need to remind you, do not open the door and let anybody come in and preach a gospel that is not having the doctrine of Christ. And the doctrine of Christ in John chapter 6, he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. So if they don't have that doctrine, don't open the door. It is written. Hallelujah. Amen. So we don't open our doors. People do press our buzzers. We don't open. It doesn't mean we are not being kind. Let not the woman feel bad. You see, sometimes you do it right, but you feel bad. But don't feel bad because it is written. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you for clapping. I appreciate that. Now, it would be good for us to understand that Jesus did not come to introduce female leaders in the Bible alone, but God did. So let's look at the Old Testament account, because we have now checked the New Testament. Let's look at Micah 6, 4. Now I'll see those who will be to Micah. Should I come for inspection? <laughs> Micah in the Old Testament. The book of Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6, verse 4. Micah 6, 4. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Yeah, I do hear somebody flipping his Bible. Do we wait? Okay, we wait. Micah. <laughs> Amen. Micah. Hear me the word of the Lord. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of of what? Servants of bondage. I sent before thee three leaders. One, Moses. Two, Aaron. Three, Miriam. So three people were ordained. Who was the head of the three? Moses. Moses. Amen. Amen. But the Bible gave us an account that Miriam went to run her mouth. Women talk too much sometimes. Some women, they say like that. So somebody will not be offended. Some women talk too much. They poke their mouth into many things. It is because women have concern. One of the things that put female women in trouble is that they are concerned about everything. They are even concerned about your dog in your house. And they end up popping their mouth into many things. So Miriam went to pop his mouth into the marriage of Moses. And he talked about that marriage. And God got upset with her because she will not say anything against spiritual authority whether good or bad it doesn't concern you look on your office leave the man alone god was very upset with that and the anger of god alone plagued her and she had leprosy and after that leprosy she could not gather confidence to stand before the people anymore so her name diminished due to the cause of her mouth. Somebody put your hand on your mouth and say, it doesn't concern me. Mm -hmm. Wow. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, which is a quotation we quoted in the book of Acts, that God's promise of the anointing, the Holy Spirit, fell both on men and 
women. So in the New Testament, we did quote from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. And in the Old Testament, it is confirmed. One of the interesting things about God is that he has made sure that his ways will have witnesses. The Bible said at the mouth of two or three witnesses, a case is what? Established. So he actually allowed the gospel to be written, not just two, but four. We have account of Matthew speaking the gospel of the great things God did through Christ. And then Mark wrote it. Then Luke wrote it. And among the gospel, Dr. Ruth, uh, uh, Luke, that was Leonard, detailed his right arts. And then, of course, John, who is the last born of the apostles, wrote. So the repetition of the scenes, the scenarios, the instances of the performing miracles of Christ was confirmed and at the mouth of two or three witnesses said God did it more so you cannot doubt it so the scripture have himself made in the Bible so that you can know it's written here it's written there and remember we learned it at the Bible school a little here a little there and that gives you the completion of the wholesome Bible we are holding so in the Old Testament it is still stated that God will pour his spirit upon all flesh. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. If you are blessed, clap for Jesus. You can see that when we read the Micah, it talked about Moses being the first, and then Aaron, and then Miriam. And Moses being the first was not the high priest. It was Aaron that was the high priest. Priest. So Moses was operating in a capacity of a political leader. Moses was as the head of the nation, leading the priests into possessing their lands. And it's, it's amazing that God has the same kind. Also for a woman in the book of Judges chapter 4, verse 5, verse 4 and 5, Judges. The book of Judges chapter 4. Four and five. Quickly open. Judges four. Judges four. Verse five. Mm -hmm. Judges chapter four. Hey, if somebody have open, please read. Now, Deborah, a prophetess. The wife of Lapadoth was judging Israel at the, that time, and she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah. Between Ramah Between and, Bethel, and Bethel in Mount Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. So we have a female who is a political leader as well as the prophet of the nation. And she was chosen by God to judge. And whenever you see the place Rama, you are sure that it is the Bible college that Samuel also operated from there. So he sat between Rama and Bethel. In other words, she was the dean of the Bible school and also the pastor in charge of the Bethel temple, the bishop of that chapel, at the same time the lawyer of the nation judging all situations whatsoever. And uh, her name is called what? Deborah, whose husband is what? Labidon. So she is Mrs. Deborah Labidon who was chosen as a political leader, as a prophet, as a teacher for Israel, and she reigned for 40 years as a leader. That's a good leader. I think yeah. we should clap for her. We appreciate wonderful woman like that. 
she's one of the daring women that I cannot even comprehend how she could dare sit on a, a horse to war. And um, if you ever appreciate the history about the scriptures you read, you can really you know, understand the magnitude power of God using both men and women to, to, to work. Because we are talking about Israel going to war against a superpower. It's just like a small group of a nation facing, let's, let's take maybe Italy facing America for war. And a woman stands to lead the troop. And God gave them victory. So you can see the race is not to the sweet. The power is not to the strong. It's not by might. Oh, by power, but by what? My spirit. Somebody say, Spirit of God, come upon me, use me, irrespective of my weak body. Amen. We have an account of Mrs. Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3. Isaiah did a good job. He did a good job. His, his wife also got born again, and they were both prophetess prophets and prophetess. We see Isaiah prophesied very well. Isaiah did a magnificent job in the Bible. It is because he had a wife that understood his calling. He had an assistant. Isaiah 8.3. His half, his better half was in the work with him. He did more. One who chase a thousand, but two who chase ten thousand. So you see over here in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3. And I went unto the prophetess. Yes. And she conceived. Yes. And bare a son. Yes. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Mata Shatar. Amen. Mata so Isaiah prophesied as a huge prophet, yet he was married. There is nothing wrong for a prophet to have a wife. But the credit of Isaiah's powerful mission work is because the wife was also anointed. There's nothing as hard as when two are not one. Then it becomes very difficult. So a female prophetess is listed in the Old Testament. Let's now salute one of the most powerful female leaders in the Bible. She was an archbishop. Archbishop. Not just a bishop, but an act of it. In 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 14. 2 Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 14. Second Kings 22, 14 and 15. So, so Elkai the priest, yes, and Haikam, and Ajbo, and Safan, and Ashahia went unto Ulda the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tiva, the son of Haras, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwell in Jerusalem in the college, and they commune with her. Amen. Amen. She dwell in Jerusalem in the college. <laughs> Hallelujah. So there was a school, a college there, and all the priests go to him for counsel, to her, for counsel. Her name is Halda. Halda. The priests of the land went to Halda to take counsel about the mind of God. She was a high priest and she was in charge of the prophets in the college in Jerusalem. She was a city leader and she spoke the word of God unadulterated. So King Josiah, if, she, if he want to take a major decision for the kingdom of Israel will have to see how that. And the Bible says in verse 15 that she said unto them, Thou sayest the Lord of Israel, tell the man. 
that sent you to me, this and that. So these are the people that God have used in the kingdom of God, both men and women. Today we studied about the women because that is the place that we have complications for you. Shall we rise as we close? I want to give you the thank you for clapping. I want to give you one minute opportunity to bow down your heads and ask God for forgiveness if you have stood against a female leader. May God forgive you. And then I want you to also pray that if you have a wife, you will encourage her to teach the gospel. Don't get jealous about it. You should encourage the woman. Don't fear. No man will take that which is dedicated unto God from you. And the woman I want to advise as a leader to humble.